Good afternoon and welcome. If you'd be so kind as to silence your cell phones at this time, we'd be most appreciative. My name is Courtney Graham, and I'm the manager for events and programs for membership here at the Art Institute. I want to thank you for joining us for this special member lecture on Degas at the track on the stage. Before I introduce today's speaker, I should mention that there will be a short survey in the thank you email for this lecture, so we'd love to hear your feedback. Today we have the pleasure of hearing from Dr. Giovanni Aloy, who you may remember from our Pleasures of Modernity lecture series last year. Giovanni is an art historian in modern and contemporary art. He studied history of art and art practice in Milan and then moved to London in 1997 to further his studies at Goldsmiths University, where he obtained a postgraduate diploma in art history, a master's in visual cultures, and a doctorate on the subject of natural history in contemporary art. Giovanni currently teaches at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, Sotheby's Institute of Art, New York and London, and the Tate Galleries. Giovanni has curated art projects involving photography and the moving image, is a TV and radio contributor, and his work has been transla translated in French, Russian, Polish, and Spanish. His first book entitled Art and Animals was published in 2011, and since 2006, he has served as the editor-in-chief of Antenne, the Journal of Nature and Visual Culture. Please join me in welcoming Giovanni. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, good. Now it's even better. Nice to see so many of you coming here this afternoon. How many of you attended the lectures on Dega I gave last year? Oh, quite a few returning for more. Nice. So, Dega. We like Dega, don't we? Oh, yes. And you've all seen the exhibition at the Art Institute, right? Yes. We're going to look at the themes of the room dedicated to Dega this afternoon. We have an hour together, and we're going to look at the connections between Dega's work on horses and ballerinas, and try to draw uh, some interesting parallels, but also look at the broader picture and think about Dega as a key artist in Impressionism, and also one that laid the foundations for more complex issues in modern art. There's something about Dega that doesn't quite get to the surface uh, regularly when, when we think about Dega as an impressionist. It's slightly reductive, if you, if you want to think about it this way, to just think about Dega's work within that group. I'll show you today how he influenced a lot more and how much more innovative he was than other impressionist painters. So, first of all, our first step is to time travel to Paris. How does that sound as a proposal for the afternoon? Is it good enough? Okay, let's give it a try. This is what Paris looked like at the time during which Degas pretty much lived and worked there. Beautiful. Paris has always been an amazing city. Of course, it's a city of lovers. It's a city of culture. It's a city of art, as we know. It's a great city of architecture. And it's also a complex city. It was a complex city during the 19th century, and pretty much it is a city of complexity today. It's always been a city of innovation, and you know that it's also been the epicenter of modern art during the 19th century. That's very much where you had to be if you wanted to partake in the movements that changed history of art forever. I wanted to start to look at the key issues, the key elements that made Paris the complex city that it was at the time, because that will enable us to understand better why Degas became the artist he became. And the first issue I want to quickly place on the map with you today is the one of social unrest. Paris has always been an exciting city, but also a city of clashes, a city of difference. And the social unrest that Dega experienced at the time in which he worked and lived in Paris was pretty substantial. One of the most important 
uh, moments of unrest that marked the life of Impressionism was the Franco-Prussian War. Many of you know, I'm sure, that in 1870, two very important Impressionist artists, Monet and Pissarro, traveled to London to run away from the Franco-Prussian War, and thereafter returned to Paris to begin Impressionism. And that's where we find that little element that French people don't like a lot. Do I have any French <laughs> visitors here today? A couple. I better watch my tongue. <laughs> we can sort of dare to say that Impressionism was born half in London, half in Paris. How does that sound? <laughs> Not too outrageous, right? We'll see that connection a little bit more today. But the social unrest is something that not only affects the way in which artists move from one city to another, but it's also something that runs through the work. Do you remember the French Revolution? That was serious business, wasn't it? Heads rolled quite literally around that time. So it's no surprise that Impressionism, with this intense desire to revolutionize art and change the rules, happens effectively in Paris. And the social unrest translates into artistic practices, art that Degas knew inside out. I'm going to tell you more about the formation of Degas in Paris uh, in a few minutes. But he was, of course, very familiar with representations such as these. Another very important aspect that goes underestimated in the influence of Impressionist artists is the renovation of Paris. The renovation of Paris, which took place around the 1850s, 60s, and 70s, was serious business. Why do I say that it was serious business? Because it changed people's everyday lives in ways that lives had never been changed before. What did it entail? Well, it was the idea of Napoleon III, and it was actuated by Haussmann. And it was a radical plan to reinvent the architecture of Paris. When I say reinvent, I really mean demolish, right? I'm sure you, many of you or all of you have been to Paris at some point, and you've probably fallen in love with the big boulevards, the wide, wide streets that make Paris so monumentally impressive and inspirational. Now, those boulevards were in there. They're relatively new, and they were created during this period because Napoleon III believed that the old medieval fabric of the city, the narrow winding roads that characterized Paris, were unhealthy. Sunshine, it was claimed, very rarely hit the ground in some of those roads, leading to infection, leading to disease. Now, that's part of the story. The other part is that those big boulevards enable the police to act quickly if unrest flourishes. Police could travel really fast on these boulevards from east to west and north to south. And you probably remember that the French liked to do one thing a lot at the time, building barricades. <laughs> Have you ever built barricades across a boulevard? Not easy, right? Barricades were built by the proletariat, very poor people. They didn't have much furniture to build barricades with. So once the streets become massive, you prevent them from doing just that. So let's say that it's a political plan, but this is what it did. Demolished many neighborhoods in Paris. Locals saw their favorite bars, their favorite coffees, their homes being destroyed. And the idea that you should document everyday life and that everyday life is important became very important to these people too. That's one of the things you might want to remember about Impressionism. That's how photography gets into the mix. Photography, which was invented in 1826 in Paris, became the tool through which artists as well as normal uh, people decided to photograph the reality around them in the knowledge that this reality might not be with them tomorrow. And as we will see today, photography plays a major role in the reinvention of painting that Impressionism will present 
to the world. The first photograph looked like this, a very, very grainy business. We can barely tell the subject here. But it wasn't long, by 1850, 1860s, as Impressionism begins to incubate its main ideas, that photography reached very good quality. Now, this is important. When photography became good, quality-wise, it posed a really important problem to artists. If I can take a picture of it, why should I make a painting of it? You see the clash? Artists began to think that painting, for the first time in the history of art, required some serious reinvention. And the last point I want to uh, place on the map, the one major influence that shaped Degas' life and at the same time the life of other Impressionists is the Salon. The Salon of Beauvoir was the biggest institution in Paris where you could see paintings. Today we live in a world that is saturated by images. Think about how many images you've seen today just when you came here and how many more you will see until you go to bed tonight. At this time, images are not quite easy to get hold of, although things are changing. Photography makes images more readily available. Printing processes become more important at this time, but paintings are still the big attraction. Think about this world. No TV, no cinema yet, no laptops, no tablets. People are excited to see paintings, and the Salon is the big exhibition that happens once a year where you can go and see the best in painting. Now, when I say the best in painting, we have to make sure we understand and we agree on the fact that the best in painting of this time is not Impressionism at all, but it's this. And this beautiful, oh, the birth of Venus. Why am I showing you this painting in the specific? Well, because in 1863, this painting won the official salon. Gold medal. It was considered to be the best. And Napoleon III loved it so much that he purchased it for himself. It's considered to be the epitome of what classical art should aspire to. And by the way, the birth of Venus is one of the most painted subjects in the history of art. I'm sure we can all see why. It's a very interesting subject, isn't it? Now, having placed all these points on the map, let's go closer. Let's get closer to Degas himself. Now, Degas was the son of a banker. And as such, like many other Impressionists, he was financially privileged. That was important because it enabled Degas to make choices that other artists could not make at the time. He decided to study art, and his artistic, uh, artistic uh, taste was very much shaped by the works of art that were considered to be the greatest at the time. It was very much inspired by Ingres. Ingres was considered to be one of the best artists of the neoclassical kind. And you can see pretty much what that entailed. The idea of old subjects, we've got Homer in the, in the painting, as well as the recovery of very classical styles of painting deriving from the Italian Renaissance. But he also liked more modern approaches to naturalism in painting. He also liked Delacroix, and you can recognize some of the uh, feathery brushstroke, the immediacy of a more romantic approach to painting, less cold less posed, more dynamic, that Degas will incorporate in his own work um, later on in his life. One of the things Degas loved to do, we know for sure, was to spend time at the Louvre. Who wouldn't love that? But what Degas used to do at the Louvre was sketching classical paintings. He really believed that classical art was still the foundation of uh, painting, and he was right. Everyone at the time thought that classical art still had something to say. And in fact, most Impressionist artists study classical art when they go to the academy. It's not um, something unexpected, and it's not something that many artists manage to escape. But it's this emphasis on the power of classical art 
that makes impressionist artists say, okay, enough of this, because it all sort of looks the same, doesn't it? And we want to paint everyday life, and classical art always looks back at history and mythology. Let's do something new. So this is the beginning of Degas' career. It's one of the paintings, anyway, that could be used as an example of uh, Degas beginning with painting. And as you can see, it goes back to the ideas of classical art. It's not very experimental, it's not very innovative. And Degas himself would actually turn around at some point in the late 60s and declare himself not particularly pleased with his early output. One of the most interesting paintings of young Degas is the one of the Bellini family. I mentioned earlier to you that uh, Degas was financially privileged and he, uh, his family had a, a, a property in Naples, so he traveled to Italy, and there he began this painting, which was then uh, completed in Paris. It's one painting that it's very classical in nature, although we don't go back to midi um, classical mythological subjects, we do nonetheless see an approach, a classical approach to portraiture. As you can see, the brush stroke is very classical, it's very... Um, clean and very tidy as a, as a painting. Art historians tend to love this painting because it captures a psychological depth, the unhappiness in the family unit. Can you see it? They seem somewhat distant from each other. The husband looks towards the wife, the wife seems to look far away in the distance, and the daughters seem to be disconnected with the father figure too. One of them, as you can see, the, the, the girl on the left, looks back at the viewer as if acknowledging that there are issues in this family and that this is not perhaps a really happy um, situation. So, Degas' life, artistically speaking, is a little predictable at the very beginning. But then, he meets this man, the original hipster. <laughs> Money. Now, Money was a character. Like Degas and the others, he had studied classical art. He knew classical art very well. But he believed in innovation. He believed in the value of contemporary life, everyday life, more than anybody else. And it is this chance encounter with Manet at the Louvre that changes Degas' artistic trajectory. Those of you who are very strong in their art historical knowledge will remember immediately that Manet was the author of this, one of the most important paintings in the history of art, Olympia. Olympia caused a major stir at the Salon of 1864. He was Manet's own response to the Venus I showed you earlier, the one painted by Cabanel. Who is Olympia? She's not a Venus. She's posing like one. She's a contemporary prostitute. Controversy. This was one of the paintings that made Paris talk. It was one of the paintings that shook the foundation of Parisian society to the core. Question being, why should we look at a painting of a prostitute? What is there to learn? What is there to admire? Many things. According to Manet, prostitutes at the time were everywhere. He knew something about that. And they transcended the structure of society. Prostitutes didn't come from the upper layers of society, did they? They were lower than the working classes. Yet, prostitutes like the fictional character, Olympia, that Manet creates, were successful prostitutes, the ones that would end up mingling with the king, with the aristocrats, with the politicians, the ones that would get to the top in very oblique ways. They upset people. They put a challenge to Parisian society, one that was difficult to address. So let's say that Manet was a troublemaker. And in a way, Degas is not quite as overt as a troublemaker, but we'll see what kind of trouble Degas stirs today. This is also another painting that you might have seen here in our collection. We're lucky enough to have it, 
and it's another very controversial painting uh, by Manet involving the flagellation of Christ. Now it's time for our dates. How are we doing so far? Is it all making sense? Beautiful. Let's continue with dates, because dates are really important, right? I try to tell my students that if you remember a few dates, you've got your bearings. Then you can fill in the space. And I know it's not easy sometimes, right? Especially today, we're so used to delegate dates to the internet. Do you ever go online, when did this happen? And then you find five different dates. You're like, oh, okay. First of all, 1863, we saw the important date. Olympia was painted, the world stopped. At least the art world stopped. It's considered by art historians to be the beginning of modern art. You know, when you hear that uh, phrase thrown around so much, modern art here, modern art there, and you wonder, when did that begin, actually? Well, most art historians agree that Olympia was the turning point. Why? It was a painting painted to upset people, to make them think. And it was painted using the classical nude in a new perspective. So, from that point onward, 1874 is our next big date. 1874 is the first Impressionist exhibition in Paris. Of course, in the meantime, Degas and all the other artists have already got together and they're thinking about what do we want to achieve with this thing that will revolutionize classical art and the idea of painting. And 1886 is the end of Impressionism. So that gives us a total of 12 years, 12 very productive years that will change the course of art over eight exhibitions, many of which were laughed at, right? It's always important to remember that Impressionism was not adored as it is today. It was unconventional, it was fresh, it was new, it was breaking the rules, and most people found it disconcerting. So, Impressionism as it functioned, as it bubbled up around Degas. The biggest name, perhaps, is Monet. Do we agree with that? Hmm, we kind of can. Right, Monet had a very clear idea of what Impressionism was meant to entail. Impressionism, was made outdoors. You went outside with your canvas, you propped it in front of your subject, and you were not meant to capture details and paint slowly like classical art would require. You were meant to capture the impression, a quick impression of what was in front of you. Everything rested on the intensity of color and the swift application of color through the broken up brushstroke that it's so typical of Impressionism. Most, most um, critics and artists, classical artists at this time, think that these paintings are not finished. They say, no, look, this is what a sketch is. Then you're meant to take this into the studio and enlarge it onto a big canvas and paint it in detail. And Impressionist artists were like, no, this is it. My relationship, my quick, impression of what is in front of me right now. You know, classical art was painted in the studio very slowly, without looking at nature, without looking at light, real light. Classical artists found inspiration from other people's paintings. They were always looking at other people's paintings to create an idealized version of reality. Have you noticed how beautiful everyone was in the beautiful painting by Angra I showed you. Everyone was very fit. Everyone was really well dressed and prepared for the, the situation. Well, everyday life is not quite like that, is it? And Monet definitely looks for the unusual, for the atmospheric effect. That's where he finds his inspiration. We find him in London more than one time. This is from our collection. I'm sure you've all recognized. Painting subjects that, strangely, were painted by other artists, like Constable. Constable worked a lot in southern England. Now, do you remember when I told you that Monet and Pissarro went to London, 1870? 
Mm. It is claimed that there they saw the paintings of Constable. Constable was also painting outdoors. He was a pioneer of this technique. However, sometimes he would do what classical artists expected. Paint outdoors, a little sketch, take it inside the studio, make it big. But you can see the vibrancy and you can see the brushstroke, quick, capture an impression. And of course, they also saw the paintings of Turner in London. Wasn't he good at capturing intense impressions, brush strokes, extremely feathery, extremely dynamic? And again, another view here of the same subject. Now, Turner perhaps went as far as even further away than the impressionists would ever get during their time. He was really ahead of his time. And of course, another amazing painting from our collection, light, sunshine, water. These are the subjects that are very, very interesting to the Impressionism of Monet. But the Impressionism of Pissarro was slightly different. It involved houses a lot. Pissarro was interested in the effects of snow. Snow he painted regularly and for which he was told that he wasn't a great painter because he painted reflections of colors on snow. To classical art, snow is white, and you paint it white. But to an impressionist artist, snow reflects all the colors around it. Buildings, the sky, objects. So Pissarro was told not to paint butter, but to really paint snow. Not nice. And of course we have the brand of impressionism of Cezanne. You remember Cezanne had his own personal idea after a while that impressionism wasn't going to last long because it lacked structure, it lacked the power of geometry, it lacked the solidity of the cone, the sphere, and the cube. He would become important afterwards, wouldn't he? He's a pretty important artist all along. Renoir had his own brand of impressionism, perhaps more in keeping, more in line with Monet's. He believed in painting outdoors as well as painting outdoor, indoors sometimes. He painted people a lot large figures, as you can see here, in a way that Monet was not interested in. Have you noticed that in Monet's paintings, people are usually quite small? He really tends to capitalize on the importance of landscape and atmosphere. And then we have Degas. Degas' brand of Impressionism is very much informed by his studies in classical art. That's why he's also interested in people. In classical art, people are the most important things, the human body. But, as you can see, he's interested in everyday life, like Renoir was interested in everyday life. And more than Renoir, he's interested in composition. You see how strange this composition is? This is one of the strengths of Degas. The innovation happens within the frame. So let's take a look at the two main subjects of today in relation to Degas' body of work, the track and the stage. Before we can actually look at Degas' horses and understand them in, in a more kind of meaningful way, it's probably worth going back to the tradition of equestrial portraits, because it's a very old and long tradition that plays a really important role in the history of art. Here's an example. Beautiful, isn't it? Great example of neoclassical art, painted in detail, of course. As you can see, the horse here has been groomed to such excess that he looks immaculate. Horses are a little bit messy, aren't they? Yeah, they're a little bit messy and smelly, and they, they do things, you know. In paintings, they always look extremely elegant. They're captured at the height of their beauty. Pretty long tails, right, and manes, quite, quite impressive. Who's riding the horse? Napoleon, the tallest man in the world. <laughs> Do you remember that Napoleon wasn't really like the tallest man in the world? So the horse here plays a very important role. It elevates Napoleon, right? Makes him look like he is the commander in charge. In the tradition of classical equestrian portraiture, the horse features as an extension of the person who rides it. Not just visually, 
metaphorically. The horse is smart, the horse is strong, it thinks. And in this case, you can see how this portrait really captures that intensity. The horse is a collaborator of Napoleon, a collaborator in victory. Very important uh, representation. And around the time, things begin to change. This painting puzzled people. You can see that there is something missing. No rider here. This is Whistle Jacket. It's a painting you will see at the National Gallery in London. And it was a horse race. It was one of those horses that won lots of uh, races. And the owner decided to dedicate a big um, portrait to the horse to commemorate it. The critics agree that you can see depth, psychoanalytical depth, in the face of the horse. It's an unconventional, it's very unconventional portrait of horses and the equestrian theme. And artists, contemporary artists, like to play with this idea of the equestrian portrait quite a lot. You may have seen this as part of our exhibition on Charles Ray. How many of you remember this? Aha, uh -huh. did we like the Charles Ray exhibition? Good. Now, you can see that the horse here doesn't look particularly victorious, particularly engaged, or particularly happy either. So what Charles Ray was trying to put together is a self-portrait on a horse in which all the values that have been attached to horses and victory in the past are stripped away. What is the result? A more realistic horse. One that is allowed to look a little bit tired and a little bit bored, like they usually are, right? It might not seem relevant to Degas, but we will see together that it is. If we look carefully at Degas's work on horses, you will see that Degas was not interested in the classical idea of triumph connected to the equestrian portrait. He became interested in horses very early on in the 1860s, and he spent quite a bit of time at the track sketching very quickly, and then finishing up his work in the studio. It was very important to him to get an essence of what he saw in front of him very quickly, and then continue the work in his own time and privacy. It is claimed that he made lots of revisions at that time too. So a lot would happen in closed, behind closed doors, unlike Monet's approach um, to painting. One of the things that's striking here again in these early works on the subject is cropping. Framing. You can see on the right hand side that Degas deliberately leaves the heads of the horses, of one of the horses at least, out of the frame. Why does he do that? Because Degas is interested in movement. Degas is interested in the spontaneity of images, and he is already influenced by photography. You know when you take photographs and something is cut off in the picture? Sometimes you consider that a bad picture. Right? He's like, oh, I missed that. But he loved that idea. He loved the fact that you could think about composition differently. In classical art, everything is put in the center and in the middle of this box, imaginary box, that is the canvas. He wanted to break that rule really, really badly. But the connection between classical art and Degas' work, it's much more complicated. So look at the horse in the middle here. This is another one of those works he made really quickly using pastels in, uh, on, on the field. But memorize that shape. Now look at this. This is an interesting painting from the Renaissance. Can you guess why I'm showing you this? Have you seen a horse there? Oh, there it is. You see it? And now let's look at Degas's horse once again. Hmm. Now, what was Degas doing? Nothing naughty, right? We have to really resist this idea that artists are cheating when they look at other, th other sources because the big masters of the Renaissance were always looking at other sources. And I've already told you that classical artists always looked at other people's paintings to make their own, right? So he was doing just that. Even when the painting looks fresh and spontaneous and captured from the moment, he does something Monet would never, ever agree with, which is 
take a source from a classical painting and incorporate it in your own. It was appropriating, right? A little bit like Andy Warhol does today. He was, well, or did in the 60s. He was really advanced in his approach to painting. And also, he didn't have much fear of breaking rules. He was able to take a risk. And that is really a quality in an artist. One of my favorite uh, representations of horses in Degas' work is this one, because you can see again the awkwardness. Just imagine you're setting out to make a painting involving a horse, and there's a pole right in the middle of your scopic field. What do you do? Most people would just go like, well, let me just move so I can get that pole out of the picture. No, not Degas. You put the, the pole right there on the middle to the right, so it's not dividing the painting in two halves symmetrically, but it's suggesting some sort of interference with the image. It gives it that freshness, once again. It gives it that idea of new. It gives it an idea of, I am here now. My body is placed here in a position that it's not really great, and I don't care. This is my view of this event, and so you have it. There's another uh, interesting point about Degas' horses and approach to the subject. We talked about the victory. We talked about the importance of the horse looking majestic, powerful, elegant. Well, Degas is not very much interested in that either. So it's not just the cropping that makes things awkward. Degas is rarely interested in the moment that is exciting. Think about the races. The horse racing, right? Speed, momentum. No. Very rarely Degas paints that moment. He tends to paint the horses before the race, when they're getting ready, they're shuffling around. He tends to paint the horses when they're training. He tends to paint the horses after the race, when they're exhausted. And this is really important, because doing what he does something he does really well, he's basically making a political statement against classical art. He's showing us horses in a way we've never seen horses before in painting. These horses don't look elegant. Look at that behind, seriously. <laughs> it is like a photograph, isn't it? You can see the inspiration he draws from the photographic language. And most importantly, we have to remember, again, we have this awkward framing, we have this overlaps of body that it's very photographic. But you have to remember that photography was exciting at the time. Photography is still exciting today, right? How many photographs do you take with your iPhones, right, in a day? You got the film rolls going and going with lots of photographs. Now, when it comes to Dega, he used photography first as a tool to investigate composition, looking at other people's photographs. But during the late 80s and the early 90s, he buys a camera and he takes photographs himself. Completely avant-garde, if you like, in comparison to other artists who didn't want to be seen close to a camera because they were afraid of that stigma that if you use a camera or a photograph to make your painting, then the value goes down. The idea is that painting has to be pure, right? Something that's self-contained as an art form, not that derives from a photograph. But we know how many artists in the modern period and in the contemporary right now exploit these ambiguities between photography and painting. And we usually love that. So another very interesting um, painting of horses that shows us that condition the previous one was about the false start. Once again, how exciting is a false start? Hmm, give me more, right? And here, rain. Classical art never painted rain because rain is difficult to capture. You can paint a wet floor, right? You can paint water on the ground or on people, wet hair, very easy to paint for classical artists who were um, extremely eloquent in their approach to um, the representation of the human body and textures. But painting rain that falls from the sky in the form of drops, not many artists would meddle with that. Very, very unconventional and original take. So Tega used to go to the track and he used to sketch. That was definitely what he did. We know that. But at the same time, he used 
photography too, especially during the 1980s and thereafter. Sorry, the 1880s and thereafter. That would have been interesting, right? One of the books on photography that we know definitely made a mark on Degas' approach to the subject was by Moy Bridge. I'm sure many of you love Moy Bridge's uh, photographs. They look like this. And many of you, I'm sure, will remember that they are associated with the birth of cinema. What did Moybridge do that was so important to Degas? Well, Moybridge became part of a, uh, a very interesting process of clarification, something that at the time was topical. There was a big discussion going on in California on the galloping of horses and whether horses had four legs because at all times one leg was touching the ground. Some people said no. Usually there is a moment where all four legs are up in the air. Other people disagreed. They said, no, that's why animals with four legs have got four legs, to have that constant traction. Well, Moybridge devised a system to immortalize horses riding in front of a series of cameras. You can see them there. There's 24 of them. There's trip wires, and a horse galloping through would be immortalized from the same perspective so that you can effectively study in a scientific manner the movement of the horse. This was extremely fascinating, not just to Degas. It was new, and it was extremely um, revelatory. It was really this idea that photography, the mechanical eye, sees something that we cannot see. It exceeds the ability of the human eye to see. Beautiful these images were, not just to those interested in science, but to artists. Look at this. This is a, a data bank of information that artists can appropriate and use for their work. And we know that Degas did just that. This is before he gets his own camera. Now, look at the uh, mule on the top left. And look at this. Does it look familiar? It kind of does. So, of course, Dega is reinventing it, right? So it's a horse. But you can see that the body shape, it's very similar. And just a few words about these little statuettes of horses by Dega. Dega was such a complex artist, he constantly worked with different media. So he worked with oil on canvas, he also worked with pastels, he worked with both of them together. He made things to pastels that some artists really questioned. Like he used to boil pastel down and make it liquid and then re-solidify pastel. He loved pastel because of the versatility and the texture that he claimed allowed him much more versatility than oil paint. But in secret, mostly, he worked on a huge number of statuettes. We're looking at roughly 300 of them found in his studio after his death. He rarely exhibited any of these. That's why they came as a big surprise. Suddenly, Degas dies, and oh, look in the studio, there's all these wax statuettes everywhere. And some of them are really, really interesting. They really show a different dimension of his engagement with form, shape, objects, and space. Like I said earlier, he was really interested in the dynamic aspect of human as well as animal bodies. And that's one of the things that links the ballerinas to the horses, one of the links we're going to explore today. I'm sure you can see the connections here between the images I showed you of the paintings by Degas and this desire to somewhat transfer what he had learned in Impressionism and the painting of horses to the three-dimensional and the sculptural. We all know that Impressionism is very much the domain of painting, isn't it? Think about Impressionism. You've got in your head all these paintings by many artists, and they're all beautiful, colorful, and fuzzy. But what about sculpture? Is there such a thing that we can confidently call Impressionist sculpture? Well, this is Degas' version of what that would be. And finally, I wanted to close this section on the horses before I talk about ballerinas for a short while with this painting, which I'm sure you've all seen in our collection upstairs. 
It really ties together all the links I have explored with you today in relation to horses. The idea of the non-victorious, uh, the idea of the everyday moment, the one that it's not particularly significant to success, power, and strength. In this case, Degas decided to paint a dramatic moment, the fallen jockey. And it's a painting he exhibited at the Salon, thinking this painting would really capture people's imagination. Because it's dramatic, because it's different. Once again, it shows us something that doesn't require celebration, but it's something that people see at the track, this dramatic moment. Nobody cared. Completely ignored. He was quite disappointed. Took it back to his studio, and there it remained for 30 years. He constantly went back onto the canvas. He erased horses. He moved horses. If you look at this canvas carefully, and if you haven't, you can go just back up, uh, upstairs and take a look now, which is one of the great things you can do in this building. You will see more clearly than in this image where erasure happened and where something else has been painted over another line or another patch of color. So, in a way, this could be seen as Degas' Mona Lisa, right? The painting that the artist cannot depart from, the painting he didn't want to sell, the painting that becomes part of the soul of the artist. He did say to a friend, he's like, I've got no interest in selling this. It's just almost like a, a massive study that keeps on building upon itself. He began as an oil on canvas, more kind of traditional and classic, and then as the artist developed his interest for these other media, like pastels, the two media intertwine and overlay in a very complex uh, kind of game that you can only witness in this uh, painting. So it's, all, it's more than a painting in a way, or it's more than another painting by Degas. It's a painting in which you can see the sedimentation of the artist's interest for materials, subjects, composition. And it's time to get on stage. How do we feel about that? Shall we? Why not? Do we like ballerinas? Yes. Now, of course, because I like to make things complicated, I'm not going to talk to you about how beautiful the ballerinas are and how pleasing they are, because they are like that. But I think there's a deeper analysis of the ballerinas that it's really, really interesting, and that it's very much linked to Degas' relationship with space and Degas' relationship to society more in general. So this is the opera in Paris. It became a major social space, like the track, in a way, was. Places in which... People used to gather, spend their time, talk, socialize, see and be seen. And I guess that that is probably one of the most important things that used to happen here, here at the uh, opera. The opera was a complex environment. And I say that with many ideas in mind. First of all, where do we start from? I could actually, well, I did. I could just do a lecture on this. I did. <laughs> Now, what's the um, tricky aspect of the Opera House? Well, we look at it from the position of the viewer, and everything looks pretty organized and tidy. But behind the scenes, there's a lot more going on. Ballerinas were under a lot of pressure. I don't know if I, do I have a ballerina here? No, no surprise. It's, I mean, not quite an occurrence, is it? And ballerinas just happen to be around. But <sighs> ballerinas train hard. And we all know that. And that's one of the connections with ballerinas and horses that Degas really liked. Degas liked people and animals who suffered for their art and put training in front of everything else. If you wanted to be a ballerina in Paris at this time, you would have to start roughly at the age of seven. Unfortunately, the training was so intense that you had to give up school. You couldn't do both. You can see what limitations that already puts immediately onto the development of a person. You're marrying yourself to this profession, and you're cutting off bridges towards the future in other fields, but you don't know something yet. How is the body of a ballerina going to change from the age of seven to the age of 12, 13, when they begin to bloom? So. Some ballerinas would make it, and they would become the star. 
they would earn a lot of money. Some ballerinas wouldn't quite make it. And I'm going to tell you more about this later on, because there is something very important about the ballerinas that don't make it in Degas' art. This is one of my favorite images of Degas taking on the subject of ballerinas, because it shows us the mothers. The mothers were behind the stage. They were there for two reasons. These are the original manager mothers, right? They are. They're very driven. Ballerinas were all coming from working class backgrounds. Aristocrats and higher social classes would never allow their daughters to become ballerinas. And ballerinas, if they got it right, could earn a lot of money. So there was an interest. The mothers spent a lot of time managing their daughter's career in a very serious manner. But they also, we know, used to spend a lot of time backstage because patrons of the opera house had access to backstage. And these men would try and prey on these little girls. Sounds sinister, doesn't it? As part of your membership to the opera house at the time, you get this privileged access. So the mothers were there to fend off these admirers that came along apparently with flowers and gifts. But sometimes it is claimed that when the mothers realized that unfortunately the career of the daughters wasn't going the right direction, it is claimed they would kind of act as agents, trying to actually set up their daughters with some privileged patron. Because after all, money was there. So mothers are really important, and it's very interesting that Dega paints mothers with their ballerinas as well. But I talked about the notion of seeing and being seen at the opera. We like to believe that today we are very distracted, right? The iPads, laptops, mobile phones, they all distract us, and we don't pay much attention to what goes on on stage. Back in the days, it was actually worse. People went to the opera to see people. That tool was not just to look at the stage. And it's brought to us, this evidence is brought to us by many paintings by impressionist artists. I love the lodge by Renoir. It really shows us this moment where, as you can see, the gentleman at the back can't be possibly uh, look at the stage, can he? Unless there's a very interesting and experimental production going on that night at the opera. The, the opera was a place where celebrities went, where the king would arrive and would be welcome, welcomed. There was um, there's, um, accounts recalling that sometimes the performance would be paused when the king was entering the, uh, the theater if the king was late. So it was a very interesting social reality. As you can see, this act of looking was essential to the representation of many impressionist artists, women especially like Cassat, because Women were forbidden to paint outdoors, so painting a subject in the theater was one of their favorite things at that time. See how many paintings were made of the lodge as a place of important relevance. And Degas, of course, has a personal take on the subject of the lodge. You can see the cropping here. It's very photographic in nature. Look at the way the fan almost occludes some of the image. Look at the way the edge of the balcony is positioned within the composition of the frame. And of course, there it is. That which allows you to look and spy on people unawares. So creative, original, using his point of views in ways that nobody else had done. But there is something interesting about Degas and this idea of ballerinas that links to the horses we've just discussed. Of the 250 and some more paintings he dedicated to ballerinas, only a handful are of ballerinas on stage, dancing, or enjoying the final applause. Most of them are about ballerinas training, ballerinas taking dance tests, really important, and ballerinas looking exhausted after the show itself. So once again, Degas is not after the moment of triumph. He's much more interested in that exercise. He's much more interested in the dedication. And you can see here that these moments, the moments of tiredness, pensiveness, 
the moments in which the ballerina is more real are the ones that he really treasures. And you can compare them in, in comparison. If you put them in comparison with the ones of triumph, you can see how these are somewhat more cold or somewhat less eloquent about the psychological depth that might be a place in the ballerina itself. It's still beautiful. Huh? I wouldn't turn them down if you gave them to me as a present. But if you are thinking about a present, please do you know, veer towards the ones of ballerinas behind the stage. Just a tip. And these paintings of ballerinas, which Monet didn't quite agree with, you can imagine why, because these paintings are made entirely indoors. There's no sunshine, there's no lighting, there's no landscape, there's no water. All the ingredients of Impressionism have gone out of the window, right? They inspired people like Toulouse Lautrec. Other artists were completely experimental and were dedicated to reinvent the language of art. What is worthy of representation? What do I want to capture an impression of? A moment of triumph or a fleeting moment that looks like many others, but nonetheless is equally important. Composition, like I said earlier, very much influenced by photography. Once again, you can see how unconventional this painting is. Look at the part that is missing here, the heads of the ballerinas. See how unconventional this cropping is? So Degas here positions himself right in front of the opera pit, and he paints some of the uh, real uh, musicians that worked in the uh, opera, and some of his friends, just to round off the image. But you can see that the ballerinas have fallen behind. They're not important. He's trying to think about his own personal experience of the position of his body in the space. And he paints this view more than one time. He's interested in really creating new scenes and new approaches. And photography then comes into his life more prominently late 1880s, early 1890s. And he takes photographs that will be effectively turned into paintings. So the ballerinas that we find from the late 80s and early 90s are mostly done this way. You can imagine the challenges involved in ballerinas. They move fast, don't they? It's part of the game. And when they guys confronted with the challenge imposed by movement, he asks some of the ballerinas to come to his studio and pose for him so that he can integrate the sketches he made with the photographs. And you can actually recognize some of the ballerinas that you see in the photographs Degas took with the ones that are then painted. He had more room to experiment with the point of view. He had more room to experiment with poses. Sometimes one ballerina was staged in different poses and then used in multiple paintings or in the same painting seen in different angles. He would just change their faces a little bit. And of course, in a way, it's possible to just look at the ballerinas as we do with butterflies at the Natural History Museum, they're just beautiful. But there's a reality to the ballerinas that Degas was much more interested in. And it's a reality that comes to surface with this work specifically. We've all seen this, right? Do we like it? Hmm. It looks pretty to us, doesn't it? Or not? Yes. But. To the people who saw it in Paris at the time when it was exhibited in the Exp uh, Impressionist exhibition, it looked awful for a number of reasons. Let me tell you why. First of all, at the beginning of our introduction to the ballerinas, I mentioned to you that some ballerinas would not make it to become the stars. Well, of course, not everyone can become the star. Their body wouldn't blossom in the, into the right proportions that the star should have. Some of them wouldn't be quite as pretty as the star should be, and they would end up being relegated to the back of the stage. Now, ready for this. These ballerinas would be called by the French rats. Isn't that charming? The rats. Now, the rats are a sort of class C ballerina, like I said, the one that doesn't make it. And they would be used as fillers. 
they're the ones kind of scouring around at the back, making the stage look busy. But their artistic ability individually doesn't really matter. They're the ones who earn very little money. And unfortunately, because of this, they are the ones who end up being caught up in prostitution at this time to round off their earnings. So, why does Degas decide to show people a rat instead of a star? Because Degas has a very interesting social commitment. Throughout his career, he painted the poor more than any other Impressionist artist did. Laundresses, workers, he was fascinated by them. And the art historians are sort of divided about this interest. Some claim that his approach to the poor, to those who suffered, to the disadvantaged, was a little cynical. Coming from somebody who was financially well off and ended up being very rich towards the end of his life because of his paintings. But others claim that his interest in horses, ballerinas, and the poor more in general, is very genuine. And it was about suffering and struggling. One thing I haven't told you is that Degas faced financial hardship right around 1874 because after the death of his father, he realized that the family fortune had dissipated. His brother had squandered most of it. So he had to start organizing the Impressionist exhibitions to make money and sell paintings. It is likely, in a big scheme of things, that without Degas' personal financial trouble, Impressionism would have never taken off like it did. Because Degas was effectively the organizer of all Impressionist exhibitions, including catalogues. He was the one putting them together because he wanted to sell. Now, let's go back to the ballerinas and let me tell you why this was so shocking and so disappointing to people. First of all, like I said, it's not an image of victory, not an image of power, not an image of success. It's the rat. And to make things worse, it was presented to audiences with this fabric tutu and the ribbon. To us today, it's like, oh, whatever, we've seen all sorts of things. People had not seen Jeff Koons at this time. People had not seen Damien Hirst, right? So using real materials in the place of traditional materials, mixing materials, was considered to be a slap in the face to classical art. People were not ready for it. But I have to tell you a secret about this statuette that it's not usually talked about. Now, what you're looking at in this museum and what you're looking at in this picture is a reproduction of the original work exhibited by Deka. The original work doesn't exist anymore. It's been cast in bronze. This is the one you're looking at. And there is roughly 70 in the world in different collections, um, just scattered. The original piece that was seen by the French people of the time had real slippers made of fabric. Mm. The corset was made of fabric. And it had real human hair. Mm. Now that's interesting. People struggle to relate to this level of realism that they had never seen before. It was shocking to them. Absolutely shocking. And you can imagine why. And it's probably because of a reason of safety, in a way, and preservation, that when this replica was authorized in the 20s, it was decided not to include the human hair, right? Because even then, it was deemed to be extreme to include human hair in an image of this kind. This is considered by art historians one of the most interesting, shocking, and troubling works of art of this time. It was presented to people in a cabinet, in a glass cabinet, like you see it in the exhibition upstairs. People were puzzled. They were like, what, what are you trying to say? That she's like a taxidermy animal in the uh, Natural History Museum? It looks like a museum exhibit. It was the first work of art exhibited by an artist in a cabinet. Today we've seen so many cabinets, haven't we? 
So it's good to know where that approach comes from, and it's good to remember that this looks pretty to us today, but in its days, it was not pretty at all. On that note, it's been a pleasure to talk to you about Dega this afternoon. Hope you enjoyed, and hope to see you sometime soon here at the Art Institute of Chicago. Thank you very much. Very kind. Thank you.